Hi, I'm Olivia from Lead Dev and thanks for joining us today. We're going to be talking about how engineering organizations can move fast without compromising code security. To do that, I'm joined by Jaime from Codacy. Jaime, why don't you introduce yourself a bit and tell us a bit about what Codacy does to help development teams in this area? Perfect. Hi, Olivia. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Jaime George. I'm CEO co-founder of Codacy. Um, Codacy essentially is a whole platform where we ensure that every line of code produced is trustworthy. So we gather um, the most amazing code analysis tools available in the market, as well as uh, lots and lots of different security um, practices, not only SAS, but also um, secret scanning, software composition analysis, pen testing, and many others also to come. And we aggregate to give you a 360 view on security. So we have not only quality gates, but also we have great standardization of and best practices for software development teams. Um, and we do this within just one platform, fully integrated into the workflow. So that's really what we do. Perfect. Well, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us. Of course. So security is a topic that's becoming more and more prevalent in software engineering. Uh, as systems become more complex and harder to track, um, and as security threats are advancing every day, we're seeing more and more engi engineering leaders um, keen to try and incorporate security practices as early as possible in the software development lifecycle. So my first question to you, Jaime, would be, we see a challenge, a really common challenge in uh, engineering organizations is when engineering leaders try and move fast without compromising code, uh, code security. Why do you think velocity and code security are so frequently at odds? It's a, it's a very common um, question that we get, we get asked uh, from our teams, but we also see in practice as being a big challenge. Um, there's many reasons. Sometimes is is uh, expect, expectations of the business imposed on engineering teams. Sometimes their managers also trying to push for the teams to be faster to deliver. Um, it's sometimes lack of competency and skills in understanding how uh, engineering should be managed or pushed. Um, what we see many times is that it's an incomplete picture to see velocity as the sole metric or the key metric that we get for business impact. There are other things that are really important. If we do everything for velocity and then we don't have any reliability of our business and service, then it's all for nothing. We go really fast nowhere. Um, and so what we we try to do or at least we try to, to help and coach our, our, our customers is there are many other metrics such as, um, you know, medium time to recover, um, or uh, change failure rate, things that are very high level as well that should exist alongside velocity. Um, so a number of questions that should be answered also before we try to push speed and velocity on our teams is, what's our engineering culture like? Are we ready to be faster, right? What's the real value of bringing a product earlier to market? Is our, is our structure ready to go as fast as we want, need, uh, wish, right? Speed really shines brighter, but we shouldn't be just, you know, focusing on that um, as we build our businesses. Absolutely. And in your experience, do you think that developer teams are see security as a priority? And if not, why should they? So in our experience, and we have a privileged position because we, we deal with so many developers, um, it's increasingly so, but not nearly enough. Um, mm -hmm. There are many reasons to feel positive uh, with regards to how development teams see security. Uh, there are things such as security by design, where we're asking developers to think about security from the get-go. And these include things such as minimizing attack services, uh, services, enforcing least amount of privileges, or having just really great secure defaults. Um, and there are also, you know, we, we, a few a few years back, we, we defined that we wanted our tools to be shift left. Um, and, you know, looking today, we have many of these tools already helping developers, should I say target developers, to get as much as possible uh, them focusing on security. But there's also, you know, a few reasons to feel a bit discouraged. Um, never before has uh, more, as this level of responsibility fell on developers. Developers are expected to formulate requirements, give estimates, code, review, deploy, test, and even keep now application security. Um, so it, they do all of this while hearing that AI will take their jobs. Uh, so it's, it's important to make sure that 
while we ask developers to take care of security, we understand the load that they're carrying. Um, I think also AI is a threat and that will change security as we know it, both from a perspective of reach through automation, but also through higher conversion rate of attacks. Um, and this will be more more pressure for developers to to tackle. And there's also, uh, you know, regulation coming, uh, especially in Europe. Um, for example, things such as cyber resilience, the Cyber Resilience Act will enforce security standards on all businesses developing software and hardware. And so this is also, again, um, more onus on, on, on development teams. We all know that once you've bought the tool or the solution, the next challenge in, in the process is getting people to actually acknowledge and then start using that thing. What would you say to engineering leaders who have recently bought a, a security tool uh, and are trying to roll it out amongst their teams? This is a great question. Um, we, we as, obviously, as a vendor, we, um, we're very incentivized to make sure that we understand and help with adoption of our own tool. And so we have seen firsthand challenges. And from our experience, there's always a top-down and a bottom-up approach. Bottom-up is more successful. So going from the developer all, all the way up to, to leadership. Um, and that um, reason why I'm saying this is because if your team, as if you're a leader and your team is already using a set of tools and those tools overlap with the direction that you want to uh, go with, um, then it's a really good idea to lean into it, right? So it's really the, the path of least resistance. Uh, when it goes, when, when it comes to top down, so let's say, for example, that you need to implement a few practices or tools um, and that needs to be mandated from the organization. Uh, first of all, it takes time. We have we have customers that are centralizing and having those those top down um, approaches. And one of the things that they uh, have success with is really the centralization, getting one platform, one standard, having everyone use it, and 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 really try to push for that um, unification. Um, that need for standards could could typically be motivated with development teams as um as as an easy way to help them migrate also between projects so if if two projects or let's say just simply two repos within one organization has different set of developers they standardize on tooling languages uh build uh tools right so the practices as well it's so much easier for one developer to move from project to the other. And that's really important. Communication also will be impacted positively if if that standardization is, is done well. Um, we've also seen success with adoption workshops, either configuration or just really trying to help as much as possible. Um, you know, get get help from vendors typically is a good idea. They have an incentive for you to use the tool. Um, and, and what we also have seen with our customers is surveys. Is is really here? Listen uh, closely to your team and developers and what they want, um, and why the, the the tools that you want to implement are not having the adoption that you uh, want to. Right. So keeping that constant dialogue and communication is a really smart idea. So really, and while we're talking about kind of developers' role in this, what are some things that developers themselves can do to upskill around uh, security practices, maybe before a tool has been adopted or, or while it's being being rolled out? Um, first of all, it's important to hear that um, aphorism announced the prevention is worth the pound of cure. Um, you'll want to focus on security, not before um, you have a business, but certainly uh, before you need it, um, which is many times already too late. Um, and so there are definitely formal certifications that developers can get. Um, for example, Offsec offers great certifications. This is one that I've actually researched. It might be very interesting for developers. I, I think learning by doing is likely the, the, the next incremental step that developers can take to start actually implementing things such as setting safe environments, interacting with these tools, go through these workshops with vendors as well. Be really helpful. There's then tons of things that they can do. There's Tons of online resources and webinars. Security is 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 the hottest, one of the hottest topics, and it, it has been for some time. Um, and then I think engaging uh, many online communities are available to this to help developers. Tons of resources I mentioned, and so um, it's not only exposing yourself to um, you know knowledge, but also trying uh, will give you tons of of, of practical insights. 
Yeah, definitely. I think culture and mindset has has a lot to do with with um, with security practices and have it, getting those adopted. Um, what advice would you give an engineering leader who is trying to kind of build that security culture in their team and uh, maybe dealing with competing priorities amongst key departments like product, security, engineering, and even leadership? Um, there's low hanging fruit. Um, you know. Making sure that the team is trained, as we just mentioned, I think is important. Mm-hmm. Um, there are things that are forcing functions of this. For example, if you're looking to to be SOC 2 compliant, um, any sort of compliance really will force your organization, your teams to look at this and implement it. Um, in, in our own organization, right, as we became SOC 2 compliant, uh, that was a, a very important reflection on on the practices that we were having as well, and so we've learned a ton by by with that certification. Um, I think starting with the managers is always always uh, is is a good idea as well because ultimately that permeates the organization as a priority. Um, it, it's making sure also another thing, which is yep, we we've learned this also as a business. If you're providing, if you're a vendor, you're providing a hundred thousand. Um, problems for that organization to fix. If everything is a priority, nothing is. And so what we also try to help our customers is for them to understand that you should be looking at um, a small set of action points or priorities or things that are easier to, to, to act upon instead of everything at once. And so focusing really on the top level, on the most urgent, the most important is a good idea. And then ultimately, um, lower the burden is is making sure security is within your uh, dev life cycle that is ubiquitous to your development that is com- you know fully embedded into the day to day so that it's it's just like another review of, of another pull request right um, and so it really forces the team to acknowledge issues when when you have um security practices and 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 insights as you're developing it's important to note it's a journey it's not one moment it's not one discrete in time it's a con- a continuous of uh, a role of events that need to happen um and if you do that successfully it will be over time uh very effective perfect absolutely some great practical advice there and I think that actually brings us nicely to the uh, to the closing question, our million dollar question. Would you say that code security is achievable for all software development teams, realistically? It's it's, it's a it's a very interesting uh, question. I think most teams need security, um, and I say most teams because um, not everyone cre- is creating software that is deployed or has um, you know a business case that is uh, many times worth protecting. Um, but for the most cases, I think in the future, security will not be um, achievable. It will be mandatory. My bet is in the next five to 10 years, we'll see a dramatic increase of cybersecurity attacks driven by AI as well as more at- at- attackers, um, which is kind of a vicious cycle, right? So AI builds more attackers, which build more AI and so forth. Um, so I think... Security as a developing software will be as natural as we think about, our, you know, a build tool or using GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, um, and it's it will be, uh, you know, like any other tool that you use. Um, and we see that, right? So you look back um, five years ago, and you didn't have as much security as you have already embedded in in, in the current vendors, and and today. Most vendors are incentivized to have more security because it also makes their tool more critical. Um, so I, I don't think it's an, an if. I think it's more of a timing issue. And I also think that they're not uh, companies that today are not thinking about security will be forced to because of the scale of 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 the attacks that are are to come. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's an important priority for everyone. Brilliant. Well, Shaim, thank you so much for your time today. This has been super insightful and we've heard a lot of practical insight and advice for teams that are looking to incorporate security practices now or in the future. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.